Good afternoon. On behalf of the UT Arlington Libraries, I'd like to welcome you to Focus on Faculty. Focus on Faculty is a series of speakers sponsored by the UT Arlington Libraries to showcase the research and achievements of UT Arlington faculty. I'd like to introduce Dr. Pete Smith, who will introduce our speaker today. Dr. Smith is the Vice Provost for Digital Teaching and Learning at the University of Texas at Arlington, where he oversees UTA's Center for Distance Education, Classroom Technology Support Services, and the Learning Innovation Laboratory. Dr. Smith came to UTA in 1992 as director of the Language Acquisition Center in the Department of Modern Languages, where he continues to serve as an active teacher of German and Russian language and culture, and is a participating faculty member in the Center for Post-Soviet and Eastern European Studies. Well, thank you very much, Eli. It's good to see so many familiar faces here today. And, and it's a particular honor for me uh, to be able to introduce my colleague and, and my friend, uh, Peggy Pritchard Koulis. Um, let me do the formal part of her introduction first. Uh, she comes to us with a PhD in English from our, our fair institution, uh, the University of Texas at Arlington, where she currently is the director of first year English. Although over the years uh, since she came to UTA, uh, she served in a variety of different roles including faculty liaison and lecturer for the Honors College, and at her very first years here as coordinator of college learning courses here at UTA. Uh, in my world, she's known as the teacher of English 2329, uh, one of our best enrolled, most popular, uh, and most high quality online courses that we have here at UTA. And to, to talk about her teaching, to say that Peggy is an award-winning teacher is, is probably one of the bigger understatements you'll, you'll hear today. Uh, let, let me read just several of the awards that, that grace her bookshelves and, and grace her walls. Uh, in 2007, she was recognized by the Provost Award for Excellence in Teaching. She's a winner of the American Literature Award in 2008. She's a recognized professor by Phi Kappa Phi in 2010. She's a University of Texas Regents Outstanding Teaching Award winner in 2011, uh, but to my mind, those all pale in comparison to the last one. Uh, she is our latest uh, recipient, our 2013 recipient of the President's Award for Excellence in Distance Education Teaching here at UTA, and we award one of those a year. It's a very small crowd. I think it's a club of eight at this point. <laughs> But what I wanted to share that you cannot read on her bio or on her web page is a comment that a colleague wrote while we were reviewing applications for that President's Award that I think really summed up the heart of Peggy's teaching and what she brings to all of us, both students as well as faculty colleagues. And this was written by a senior faculty colleague here at UTA after reading and, and learning about uh, Peggy and her teaching. And he wrote, and I quote, I enjoyed reading Dr. Coolidge's statement on teaching because she addressed so many of the concerns about distance education that I myself, as an experienced UTA faculty teacher, have, as well as many of the faculty colleagues I interact with every day. Dr. Coolidge believes fiercely that distance education courses, if designed and executed properly, provide all students with an opportunity to become more visible and to become active <coughs> participants in their learning. Students gain confidence, and in particular, they develop significantly their ability to think, respond, and write. Peggy teaches us that in this type of environment, students actually begin to teach themselves, take active, responsible roles in their own learning and professional development throughout life. And I can think of no better introduction to, to Peggy's teaching than, than that statement. And she's gonna follow up on that statement today and talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts um, so please, uh, along with her, her colleagues that she has brought with us, join me as she talks about not-so-distant collaboration and community in online education. Peggy. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for that really lovely and generous introduction. And thank you all for being here today. I'm especially grateful to the UTA Library for extending this invitation to me, and I'm pleased to be able to speak about some of my teaching experiences 
and I'm really happy to have this opportunity to thank many people who have contributed to the success of my online teaching. I particularly want to thank all those at the Center for Distance Education who work so generously and patiently with us. So if you are here from Center of Distance Education, could you kind of wave so everyone can see? Scott, don't be shy. All right. <laughs> thank you all so much. My presentation is divided into two parts. The first segment of the presentation takes the form of a teaching autobiography. Uh, and from the onset, I want to acknowledge its historical aspect. Many of the discoveries I made teaching will not seem very new right now. However, in 2008 and 2009, these practices were not as widely utilized as they are today. And Blackboard wasn't even our main learning management system. But I include these reflections on teaching because they are important in my own pedagogy and they brought me to a place that has had a remarkable impact on my course content and my personal pedagogy. In the second segment of the presentation, we will focus on a collaborative teaching model that has been and continues to be the practice that keeps my online course, English 2329, a sophomore American literature course, vibrant and influences my own teaching and the instructional practices of some of my colleagues who have agreed to participate in our discussion today. Some of the most important changes in my teaching and in some aspect for my administrative duties have come about because of what I learned from online teaching. My primary goal in developing an online course was to implement the best practices of face-to-face -face instruction into the distance education environment. What I didn't anticipate, however, was how improved my face-to-face -face teaching would become when I employed the best practices of online teaching. I have many examples, but don't worry. I am only going to classify them <laughs> under four major categories. Personalization, participation, technology, and collaboration. Although I attempt to discuss my teaching practices under these headings, the categories are not discrete and tend to intersect and the collaborative element is intertwined in all the categories. The first element of what I learned is personalization. Students in face-to-face -face courses, they see us, they hear us, they get to know us, they know our personalities. The same personal aspect can get lost in online courses. In fact, one of the great challenges of online teaching is bridging the distance that is perceived to exist in distance education. Students often seem to operate under the impression that the course is being delivered to them by a machine rather than a real human being. This distance has to be bridged with purposeful strategies that seek to make oneself known within the computer learning environment. One way to personalize a distance education course is obviously to put our personalities in our courses, something we can't avoid doing in a face-to-face -face course and probably don't even think about. But our personality can get lost in an online course. The first versions of my American literature course were written according to a rigid template provided by a third-party company hired by UTA. I often felt that I had to funnel my course into an inflexible package that I, didn't, that I didn't always believe worked for my subject area. When the American Lit course was eventually made available for students through our own Center for Distance Education, I believe a true collaboration began between course development and course design, and I was able to personalize my course. I owe much gratitude to Tom Parmalee, my course designer in CDE. He sat by my side for many hours as he made what I envisioned for the design and delivery of American literature a reality. He wasn't hesitant about offering suggestions or corrections, but he was always open and respectful of my own pedagogy, which I felt had been lost in previous non-UTA versions. In retrospect, Tom and I merged our areas of expertise to create a course that worked according to best practices of design and content. A second strategy for personalization of online courses is making sure that students can see the instructor. Dr. Chris Conway from Modern Languages probably doesn't know of his influence here, but I once heard him talk about videos he made at home for use in his own courses. 
I realized that this was one more way to humanize and personalize the interaction between teacher and student, and a way to make the course very up to date. Dr. Shelley Christie, the, center, uh, the Director of Distance Education uh, in English, has helped me in so many ways. And a good example of her collaborative leadership is how she helped me learn to film and convert videos for use in my online course. These videos are usually shot on my iPhone or a computer camera. And I might film them in my UTA office, my home office, or even in my kitchen. The lack of professional production actually humanizes the teaching experience and shows me as a real person, not just a talking head or someone hidden behind a computer screen. Because the videos are made in response to something happening in the course at the moment, I am also able to refer to world events and popular culture in ways that show I am in the course with the students. This is one strategy that has helped me bridge the disconnect I experience with some students, and it's opened up some good conversations that transfer into online office hours, another practice that has personalized the online class. Sometimes we have to meet face-to-face -face with students, or meet voice-to-voice -voice with students, to solve, or clear, solve a problem or clarify an assignment, usually a complaint. <laughs> Quite a bit of information can be confused or misinterpreted if we only communicate by email. In fact, our panelists will expand on this topic a bit, bit later. Using Adobe Connect or Blackboard Collaborate allows students to see you as you answer questions or give advice on assignments in real time. These sessions can be saved and reviewed by participants or viewed by those who weren't able to pop in during the session. I see this practice as workable for both online and in-seat courses. It's one more way to personalize and adapt to student needs. Kira Cox Bubala from CDE practiced with me while I figured out how to get my camera, headset, and computer screen to work in order to conduct online office hours. She made sure I was adept at using this before I went live with my students. I want my course to be personalized and humanized, but I do want to come across as a confident professional. So practicing this technology ahead of time is really important. When I was a real face and a real voice to my students, the atmosphere of the class changed and the interaction became more collaborative and respectful. You will also hear more about this practice of video conferencing from one of the panelists later in the presentation. The second category from the what I learned list is about participation. Creating challenging discussions that invite student participation and draw students into subject matter requires thoughtful class planning. Visiting face-to-face -face classes taught by some outstanding UTA professors in other disciplines continues to influence the way I think about student engagement. So I'm grateful for the models of good pedagogy I've had the privilege to observe in a political science class taught by Dr. Rebecca Dean and an astronomy class taught by Dr. Neela Virabathina. Both demonstrated ways to draw students out and get them involved in class, and I continue to think about the kinds of questions they pose when I develop discussion. Using online discussion may not seem so remarkable, as I am sure many of you implement similar Blackboard activities in your face-to-face -face classes. However, in 2009, this was a relatively new strategy. The students in my women's literature course used the Blackboard discussion feature to distill some of the events of the Hermann's lecture series on food, literature, and culture sponsored by the English department. Since the class focused on food narratives, the lecture series on campus provided a natural tie-in to the course. Students were required to attend events and then participate in online discussions of the lectures. Often undergraduate students attend lectures and then they're left without a way to process what they have heard. The online follow-up discussions gave these students a safe place to ask questions and try out their own interpretations without worrying about what an audience of faculty members and graduate students might think about them. It also created a place for me to assess how students build course requirements. Adding an online discussion component to a face-to-face -face course also means that class is always in session, even when the university is closed. At the beginning of spring 2011, our area was crippled by the now infamous Super Bowl ice storm. <laughs> the UTA campus was closed for five days. 
and many professors lamented the loss of class time. However, my classes stayed on schedule because of the online discussion and assignment features in Blackboard. And I had anticipated a closing because of Super Bowl, so I had it placed in my syllabus that even if campus was closed for weather or any other event, check Blackboard because we will have class. And that continues to remain in my syllabus. It saved me many times. <laughs> The UTA, I've already said that. However, my classes stayed on schedule. The experiences in distant education once again prepared me to make teaching and learning possible even when our class was not meeting face to face. During that week, my History of American Literature students debated the significance of John Winthrop's 1630 sermon, A Model on Christian Charity. They worked in a group analysis of a poem by Phyllis Wheatley, and they argued about how to interpret elements of Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. The point here isn't just that we were able to have a very productive learning online, but that these students participated more thoughtfully and fully than in previous face-to-face -face meetings. And once we returned to the classroom, their participation continued at a much higher level. There are many other benefits to online discussions, and one of our panelists will expand this point a bit later. It's great when you write a paper, but then you say, well, I'm not going to talk about that because somebody else is. <laughs> the third lesson I learned was about technology. Use technology if it has real benefits to students and teachers, not just because it's there. The focus of my online American literature course is all about reading, writing, and critical thinking. No technology can replace or supplant these important student learning aims. In fact, the typical student in one of my online sections may not even be able to save a Word document as a PDF file. Many have no idea how to use PowerPoint or how to insert images into documents. So the basic delivery of online education still poses a technical challenge to many of our students. And I'm obviously not the most cutting edge computer user. So this is where I tell the story about calling OIT with this horrible desktop problem in my office. My speakers were emitting this loud pinging sound, and my monitor was just this repeating row of one letter over and over and over again. So I called a very nice man in OIT, and he listened attentively and was very sympathetic, and obviously my problem was perplexing, so he put me on hold. And while I was on hold, I moved two books on my desk. <laughs> Oh, those had been on my keyboard. <laughs> and so then I thought, well, should I just hang up? No, oh, that darn ticket. He knows who I am. <laughs> so I decided everyone needs a good story to tell about someone else in their office. <laughs> All right, now I've lost my place. But anyway. <laughs> um, so I tell you that to say that, you know, I am really not a cutting edge technology person. And I still believe that I've had really great success teaching online, mainly because of all the support I've been given. However, there are many, many instructors at UTA who are using the most remarkable and impressive kinds of technology. And two of them will be giving a presentation Friday. I just saw one of them walk in. In fact, Peggy Simmingson from Education and Jennifer Roy from Nursing will present video conferencing tools for teaching, a seminar that promises to be a very useful talk on integrating technology. In our teaching, we can use Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Snagit, Camtasia, and we can flip our classrooms. However, one lesson I have learned is that if the allure of technology and the fun it provides for teachers are the only reasons for implementation, then it is better left alone. Nor should we develop inferiority complexes because of what we hear that others are doing with technology in their course. My rule is this. If it positively impacts students, or it makes an easier workload for teachers, then, and only then, should we think about using it. And we have followed that rule today by not having a PowerPoint, <laughs> screenshots, or any web links. <laughs> One way that technology has been very, very helpful and had many positive applications relates to my administrative position as Director of First Year English. We now use Blackboard technology to supplement teacher training and support our instructors. As director, I assist over 50 instructors and graduate assistants in their teaching of many sections of English 1301 and 1302. 
With the assistance of Kira Bubala and Amy Irving, Urban from CDE, we configured an organization course shell on Blackboard for first year English in order to centralize all training, all teaching materials for this large number of first year English instructors. We now have FYC Org as the central repository for all assignments, teaching helps, rubrics, course readings, and other materials for first year English. With training in, OB, in Adobe Connect, I was able to make an instructional component with Cura's help to teach all instructors how to move material from FYC org into their own course shells. Having these teaching resources readily available to instructors has cut down on email and face-to-face -face meetings and serves as a valuable tool for strengthening our teaching. This enterprise has been so successful that it informed another collaboration, this time with UTA Testing Services. And with help, once again, from CDE, we are now in our first semester of utilizing Blackboard organization shells to administer and score the English Department's Advanced Standing Exam and the essay portion of the CLEP Modular Exam. The fourth lesson I learned from online teaching is the importance of collaboration. You've already heard me name several people who have provided behind the scenes collaboration to assist in course de design and delivery. However, in the next portion of the presentation, we will put forth a model of collaboration that we believe would benefit instructors from various disciplines who teach both face-to-face -face and online. To teach successfully requires that we continually assess our teacher effectiveness and reflect on student success. However, once we're no longer graduate teaching assistants and become faculty members, we often stop getting formative responses to our teaching. We do receive comments from our annual reviews, and we get student feedback each semester. While both types of evaluation can be helpful, each is limited and often fails to provide authentic and practical advice. And although we might have a peer faculty member observe an actual class, we know that seeing only one class won't provide a full picture of our teaching. And as a result, the peer evaluation must report on only 50 to 90 minutes of instruction rather than a semester's worth of class and all the other elements that make up aspects of teaching. It wasn't until I developed the online American literature class and other instructors became the teachers of record for that class. So I, I need to make this clear. I'm the course developer, but many more sections run of that than I could teach. Well, I don't know. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> so other people come into those courses and they're the teachers of record. So it wasn't until that happened that I began to actually receive formative, practical, and authentic evaluation in my teaching practices. I wish I could say that from the very beginning, I expected my colleagues to provide constructive and insightful feedback over every aspect of the course. But I can't say that. In fact, when my fellow English teachers began to offer suggestions for course improvement, I felt as if someone had told me that I had an ugly baby. <laughs> when others began to teach my course, my teaching was put under the microscope in ways I had never before experienced. And I worked, and after I worked through my initial brittle reaction to feedback from colleagues, I began to see the great advantage of receiving advice from knowledgeable, experienced instructors in my own field and the results of better course assignments, clear course policies, fair grading practices, and streamlined course content. Once I decided to embrace advice from colleagues, I began to seek out even more feedback from them, and now we think of our work in American literature as a collaborative effort. We meet, we communicate, we help each other. The collaboration has several layers. Course developer with instructors, instructors with instructors, students with instructors, and of course, CDE professionals with everyone. I am joined by several of the instructor collaborators today, and each of them will discuss some aspect of collaborative teaching and how this approach not only improved the American Lit course, but also translated into their own teaching in other ways. As a result, three of these instructors are now developing hybrid or online courses in their specific areas of expertise. Joining me today are Tracy Lynn Clow, director of the UTA Writing Center, 
Dr. Catherine Warren, Senior Lecturer in English, Bethany Schaefer, the Undergraduate Advisor in the English Department, Rachel Maraboho, a Graduate Teaching Assistant in the English Department, and Dr. Joanna Johnson, Senior Lecturer in English. As Dr. Kula has indicated, designing and delivering an online course to students takes significant collaborative effort among and between academic units. And while this effort may seem relatively mundane, it wasn't that long ago that many higher education, many in higher education, were skeptical about the value of collaborative learning and were reluctant to embrace strategies that would encourage collaboration of the kind we are here to discuss. We are among a group of educators who have come to appreciate the forms of collaboration that writing scholars such as James Brophy, Patricia Cross, and Harvey Weiner championed. These scholars were among the first to convincingly argue for the craft of interdependence as a necessary and important part of the classroom experience, especially in the reading and writing environment. But even now, we often attend to the significance of two basic forms of collaborative effort in the classroom, student to student, through peer reviews, group discussions, group presentations, and research projects, or colleague to colleague, conference presentations such as this, articles, course development, etc., which seem to lend themselves to natural partnerships. These partnerships are indeed important, if sometimes fraught, but I want to focus on another important and natural collaboration, the one between student and instructor. I have found myself particularly intrigued by the opportunities that online courses and distance education have for creating student-faculty collaborations. This became especially obvious to me this past summer when a student enrolled in an online American literature course I was teaching was browsing through the assignments, paying close attention to the descriptions of each and, value, and the values assigned to them. The student alerted me to concerns he had about one of the assignment descriptions and the lack of precise rubric for grading. The student was not rude, nor was he complaining. In fact, he carefully followed all the policies on the model of communication we describe as necessary to foster cooperation in an academic setting. I read his questions and reviewed the assignment and asked him to be patient. Indeed, the directions did seem to require refinement. The oversight occurred after Dr. Kulas and Bethany and I collaborated on an adjustment to the course and had modified the weight of some of the assignments. We hadn't considered how this adjustment might require a requisite adjustment to the actual guidelines for the assignment. Additionally, when we adjusted our course content, things went wrong, and the rubrics did not populate in my course shell. Adding the rubric was a fairly simple fix. But responding to the student's very direct and specific questions about the writing prompt demanded more attention and more collaboration. I couldn't simply respond to the questions as I would in my own face-to-face -face course because when we enter a collaborative environment, we explicitly and implicitly agree to consider the other members of our network. For, an instructor, for instructors like myself who are primarily engaged in face-to-face -face courses, this isn't always an intuitive process. Dr. Kulos, Bethany, Bethany, and I had to hash out the guidelines that made sense, would work for all those teaching the online course, and would be fair to all the students enrolled in the class. The students in an online course play, play a tremendous role in the collaborative field. Their questions and concerns can have a direct impact on the content of the course, and we need to be open to the type of collaborative relationships that may not immediately be recognized in a tr traditional classroom setting. Because of his questions, this student helped us redefine an assignment that not only benefited him, but his classmates and his instructors. It's obvious that appropriately described and clearly written assignments provide students the best chance at success. But only through our collaboration with our students can we begin to define what appropriately described and clearly written assignments mean for students. Online classes offer a new platform for fostering the kind of collaboration that can be positive for students 
and improve our teaching. This is just one example, and I do not mean to suggest that this cannot happen in face-to-face -face classes. I can't say whether this student was emboldened by the wall that separates the student from instructor in an online environment. But just as discussion <coughs> questions in an online environment can create opportunities for silent students to find their voices, students in online courses sometimes have greater access to materials and experience a greater freedom to address their concerns in ways that those in face-to-face -face courses may not or are afraid to do because they may feel stupid, right? Nor does this example um, is this example meant to deny any of the problems that can creep up in online courses where students believe they have 24-hour access to their instructors and therefore email question after question without reading the available online material. But it does demonstrate that opportunities for online courses can present, both for students and their instructors. I know my experiences in online courses inform my teaching in face-to-face -face classes. I write better assignments and more detailed instructions for my face-to-face -face classes because I consider more carefully the questions that students will have but may not feel comfortable in asking. Teaching online is challenging for many reasons, not the least of which is the fact that the teaching is conducted almost entirely in writing. To say this is to point out the obvious, but the implications of this for students and instructors, which Trey touched on in her comments, those might not be so obvious. When we teach Dr. Coolis' course, we are asking students not only to grapple with complex literary texts, which is hard enough on its own, but also to interpret various other texts the discussion board threads, the policies, the prompts. Ensuring the course apparatus is clear and easily navigable is, as Trey indicated, a necessity. But clear writing only goes so far. For even with the clearest instructions, students always have questions. And how do online students ask those questions? Through writing, they email us. But a successful email exchange requires at least two things. Students must be able to ask their question clearly and understand the response that we send. If those sound like easy enough conditions to meet, think again. <laughs> Many of our online students just aren't very good readers. Many of them don't speak English as their first language. For these students, the course can be a minefield of misunderstanding. Not only do they not understand the literature, they often have trouble understanding even our clarifications. So what's an instructor to do? I've tried to bypass the pitfalls of misreading by giving students the chance to ask questions in real time, using Adobe Connect and Blackboard Collaborate to host the virtual office hours that Peggy referred to in her remarks. In these sessions, I talk about the week's lesson on a live video stream, and the students type their questions into a chat box that is visible to all participants. I respond to their comments as I go, and the students' interjections, the students interjections shape my remarks. No medium can allay all misreading, to be sure. It isn't as if my switch from writing to speaking <coughs> clears everything up magically. But ever since I implemented the office hours over two years ago, the mood of the course has shifted. This may be because the office hours had the welcome, if unanticipated, outcome of letting me, as one student put it, spontaneously teach. The students and I get to know each other better in this environment because it relies upon unscripted exchanges and the vividness of those exchanges can make things click. As when I attempted to explain the relationship between motifs and themes with an improvised reference to looking at the moon with my daughter. A student wrote to me later to say that the example stuck with her. Quote, I look at the moon now and picture you pointing your finger at it while having bonding time with your child and recall the finger, what's doing the pointing, is the motif and the moon, what's being pointed at, is the theme. The analogy may not be perfect, such are the risks of spontaneity. For my part, the sessions let me see my students in action. The immediate back and forth showcases their senses of humor, compassion for each other, and commitment to learning. Even though my solution to the problem of misreading was partial at best, I am grateful for the technology that enables an instance of what Peggy called personalization, the chance to interact with my online students in a way that makes them more human to me and me more human to them. Thank <laughs> you.
I'm currently teaching my seventh section of Joshua Coolis's online course. The very first time I taught 23 29 online, I found myself most fascinated with the discussion boards. What was most intriguing to me was that every single student had to participate every single week. I was able to hear from 42 different voices in ways I was never able to before in a face-to-face -face class. For example, one student had a very personal connection with Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. The prompt for the discussion asked students to think about the emotional baggage that the soldiers carried within this story, in addition to the physical list listed in the story. <clears throat> My student, in addition to providing an insightful analysis of the things they carried, felt comfortable enough to share his own war story and to list the emotional baggage he carries every day as a, as a result of his experience with war. He received more comments on his one post than any other student for the rest of the semester. A few days after the post, I received a private message from the student thanking me for using this specific form as he would not have felt comfortable sharing this in a face-to-face -face class. He mentioned that the genuine responses he received from his peers will stay with him for years. The one discussion forum made me a believer in the purposefulness of this online tool. During the same semester, I was teaching a face-to-face -face course of a very similar nature. The class discussion mainly fell on my most outgoing students, the ones who were always willing to volunteer. I never forced students to speak in my class unless they actually want to. While I appreciated the earnest investment in class participation, participation for my extroverts, I found myself paying special attention to those who chose not to speak in the face-to-face -face course. I knew, based on previous writing I had seen from them, that I had many intelligent students with lots of knowledge to share, but many of these students just didn't feel comfortable having the floor in a face-to-face -face course. I became determined to allow each student within my classes to find their voice in some way with their peers. As such, I've decided to create my own hybrid course, specifically to take advantage of the discussion board. While my students will have the opportunity to see me face-to-face -face once a week, they'll also have an opportunity to have their voice heard every single week using the discussion forum. Prior to teaching online, I really thought I had my face-to-face -face teaching figured out. I had good lesson plans, I rarely felt the need to speak to other instructors about what I was thinking about teaching in class that day. However, after teaching this online course and continuing to teach the course, I've learned to look at my assignments with fresh eyes and am now more willing than ever to take an assignment to a peer and say, what do you think of this? I'm truly grateful for the experience to work with these wonderful colleagues um, and under the guidance of Dr. Coolis. Unlike Bethany and the other experienced instructors here, this is my first time teaching an online course. And my experience as an instructor for English 2329 uh, has truly been a collaborative process between myself, Dr. Coolis, the creator of the course, and Bethany and Dr. Johnson, who are also instructors um, teaching the course this semester. One of the most challenging aspects of teaching this particular course is the fact that someone else developed it. Um, and this means that I'm learning how to grade each assignment as my students are completing them. As teachers, we have certain criteria um, f about the kind of work that merits A, B, C grades. However, when the assignments have been developed by someone else, who is also your boss, there is added <laughs> pressure of trying to ascertain what the creator's expectations are in terms of student grades. One thing Dr. Coolis and I decided on early this semester is that we would have grade norming sessions for each of the major writing assignments. This would enable me to learn what the expectations for each assignment were from the creator of the course and clarify any points of the grading rubric that I might be unsure about. The sessions were each uh, conducted in the same way. Dr. Coolis, Dr. Johnson, Bethany, and myself would read through the particular assignment we were grading and then review three student papers. Using the detailed rubric created for the assignment, we would each grade a paper and then discuss our grades. We also discussed each category on the rubric and broke down our rationale for assigning a certain point value for each category. For example, we would examine the introduction and thesis statement in an essay and discuss why that introduction and thesis statement should be considered good instead of fair and then grade accordingly. Looking at the distinctions of each section of the rubric with other instructors established a clear set of guidelines for me to follow as I graded on my own. Another helpful part of the sessions um, that has also helped me in my face-to-face -face class was our discussion about global comments. 
Dr. Johnson pointed out in our first grading session, something we all know, that students often make similar mistakes on any given assignment. So it's a good idea to have an open document while you are grading that has several global comments you can cut and paste into the comment section of the rubric, which is something that you can only do when you have a rubric that's online. Um, for example, the most recent essay students in our course were required to write was an essay analyzing the meaning of a poem. They were also asked to include a discussion of the poetic devices and figurative language that contributed to the poem's meaning. Many students provided analysis of the poems, but failed to mention anything about the poetic devices or figurative language. It cut down on my grading time for this assignment by having a comment prepared about the lack of discussion concerning these points that I could paste into the comment section of the rubric, which is not something I would have done before Dr. Johnson had pointed that out. Beside the benefit of grading together, these were also mentoring sessions for me. I was learning about the course, the assignments, and the grading expectation from the course developer and two seasoned instructors. I had the opportunity to ask questions about assignments, and I still do because I'm still teaching it, and get clarification about what our expectations for our students are. This collaboration has made my first experience as an online instructor enjoyable and has also helped me to see the benefits of creating online grading rubrics to use for my face-to-face -face classes. Grade norming is just one way we attempt to ensure consistency across many sections of the same course. Another issue we've encountered with the course where students do not see you face to face is that they sometimes lose track of the student instructor dynamic. At times, it even seems like their emails were addressing us as much as they were a, would a customer service agent. <laughs> Additionally, we often faced long, detailed emails about why an assignment was not completed on time and how they needed or we needed to reopen links, no matter what time it was, to accommodate them. Consequently, we have developed very clear course policies, refined and added to almost every semester, which detail our expectations as well as cyber etiquette. The course now includes tabs with such headings as when things go wrong, <laughs> interpretation and grading, and the much needed policies for communication. Through these policies, we can convey to students that we are not in fact 24-7 outsourcing who would be available to reset their quizzes at 3 a.m., nor could we be expected to reply to emails instantaneously. We can also explain that grading was not, in fact, random and completely subjective, as Rachel has pointed out, and that some assignments were weighted more heavily than others. We included information about how to communicate with your instructor, asking them to, quote, respect the model of communication used in educational settings, unquote, and reminding them that your professor is your guide and mentor, not a customer service representative who processes complaints. Your professor wants to work with you in a collaborative manner. Demanding service or action from her is not the keeping with the educational model. It will not foster a spirit of cooperation. This is also a really great thing to cut and to paste into your in class or in C <laughs> syllabus as well. These course policies serve as a contract so students understand our expectations and can be easily directed to the policies in writing when issues arise. Including a syllabus quiz during the first week helps to ensure that students actually review these policies early in the course. The value of clearly stated policies that cover communication, technology, deadlines, and grading is immeasurable as it ensures fairness to all students across many sections of the same course. Students usually understand they are not being treated unfairly and have become more graceful about accepting the consequences of their actions. Through set policies which hold both the student and instructor accountable, we are able to encourage personal responsibility. The research on collaborative teaching seems to emphasize collaborative learning for students or several forms of team teaching or paired courses. When peer collaboration is discussed, it seems always to be for the purpose of evaluation, with pedagogical improvement being an ancillary effect. And what we have described today is distinct from these higher education models and may actually have more in common with the team approach used by elementary school grade level teams who plan assignments and curriculum together, although this public school model still differs substantially from the practice in which we are involved. Our version of collaborative teaching has some distinct features that I believe are important for those considering adopting this practice. 
First, collaboration works when it is requested by an instructor, not forced upon them. We have to seek out feedback and ensure that it is authentic and practical. Second, collaboration examines actual teaching elements by having others implement them. For example, you write an assignment and when you think it's perfect, you ask a colleague to use it in his or her class. Then you will have to remember characteristic number one. You wanted feedback. <laughs> Third, collaboration calls for shared knowledge, either in an academic subject or in best teaching practices. Fourth, collaboration requires trust and confidentiality. Fifth, collaboration includes mentoring. Collaboration shouldn't be self-serving. New instructors should be included in order to introduce them to new teaching experiences and to involve fresh voices in the collaborative process. And finally, collaboration will bring about change. Before entering into a collaborative teaching scenario, one must be willing to embrace revision of both content and pedagogy. Being teachable shouldn't just apply to students. And I invite you to consider what lessons you have learned through your own teaching and how collaborative teaching practices have the potential to make what we already do well even better. Thank you. I know Peggy and her colleagues would love to entertain questions, and uh, after such an inspiring presentation, I know we have quite a few, so please. Are y'all thinking about the desserts? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Instead. Yes. Where are those? Say, yeah. The main population of your students is, I mean, are they remote students who need to take the course online, or do they just want to take it online? I think there are two populations. The first is the course is part of the core RN to BSN program. For those of you who don't know, this is a massive online degree program for, from nursing, and so it's part of the core requirement. And many of those students are very, very far away. And Pete, you can help out here. The CDE courses are a combination, but really what we're seeing, I think, in CDE courses is many students are taking on-campus courses and then maybe one CDE course. So we actually have both of those dynamics in place. So we have to be very careful about telling what time zone that we are conducting office hours in or what time zone we mean when we put a deadline in. Probably speaking, the students are in about all 50 states, we know that for a fact, in about 50 to 60 countries. Other questions? Uh, Dr. Johnson may want to take this one since she brought up classroom etiquette. Um, what have you noticed, have you noticed any difference between, in terms of discussions, face-to-face -face discussions online, do you see differences, and I think, I'm particularly thinking in terms of, are either of them, let's say, more restrained than the other one in terms of what the students are either willing to say or what they will let themselves say? Yes, the in-seat classes are way, usually way more restricted. Mm -hmm. Students who have never, sp I had the same experience that Peggy did with the uh, snow day or something like that. So I put, so I didn't leave my class day, I put a discussion online. It was actually right in the middle, it was this point in the semester, um, a couple of years ago. And so I did an online discussion and people who I'd never heard from in my NC class were writing wonderful responses and original postings to a prompt. So that sort of answers your question, I think. It could go either way. They're very respectful, though. I don't uh, that was the other thing I was wondering about is, uh, even if they don't know each other. how about the etiquette level? Um, I think even in each, even with the online classes, I think they're very respectful of each other. And they spend a little more time thinking about it. A lot of times they don't self-censor in class. If things come out that they don't, yeah, it's not here. They don't maybe mean to say or it comes out. But, but with the um, online discussion, I think they think about it a little bit be more before they hit post. I almost would have expected the opposite. You no, know, it's very respectful. Well, you know, once it's written, yes. it's always there. Yeah. And I don't know if they're really aware of that, but you know, there seem the only the most disrespect you would see in an online course is sort of the fact that tone often gets lost in communication with one's professor. Yeah, the and some of you teach have experienced that, that tone gets lost in email. So, you know, that's the where I have seen the main kind of disrespect, if that's what you're asking about. Well, I think it's interesting, actually, that 
lots of times I tell my students, you know, you don't have to agree with the person whose discussion post you're responding to. Right. You're absolutely allowed to disagree and present a new idea. And we talk about ways very specifically how you can disagree respectfully, which you can do that in a face-to-face -face class, but I think they often forget that because it's passion-driven. Like, this is wrong, I have to tell you it's wrong. But in a face-to-face -face course, they, you're right, there is that little bit more time to think because they actually have to hit a button to make what they're saying exist. Otherwise, it doesn't. It only exists in front of them. I, maybe one of the reasons I was thinking about this is just a couple of days ago, um, I was talking to one of my, we were having a discussion in my tech writing class, and this whole topic of uh, particularly discussion boards came up. And one of the students said she had, I think this was fairly recent in another kind of class, they had gotten into a discussion of, I forget what this topic, but one of the students in this discussion that she was involved with came out with something that my, my jaw just literally dropped when I heard it. I could not believe that anybody had actually said this on a discussion board. And she said that the professor had like the next day put out a notice that said, okay, the following is not acceptable behavior. So they, they well, and Alan, out. in this course, there is a statement about how one operates in discussion environment <coughs> before the students ever begin their first it, not that they've read it, but it is there. <laughs> but it is there. <laughs> if they would choose to actually read the instructions, there's the opportunity for them to do that. So, but, you know, I don't see the vitriol, the hate that you see, like, you know, on a sports <laughs> um, blog or, you know, comments to an article or something. You know, I, I found that students generally are thinking, and, you know, one of the principles we know that before you let students talk, they ought to write. So they actually have something to say, and the online environment sort of makes both of those things happen at the same time. I will say you get more over disclosing, but I wouldn't say it's it's me or me scared. Yeah, you just learn a lot of things. Yeah, that you take back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How do you go about measuring satisfaction outside of the survey? I, I heard you mention before that um, the online environment, this is education, wasn't as readily accepted, and now it has become that way. I've taken online classes. But as well, and I'm in a master's program for global e-learning, so I'm taking that online as well. And one of my topics has to do with student satisfaction and discussion boards and things like that. How do you go about measuring that if that is just Probably not any better than we're able to measure it in face-to-face -face courses. I mean, realistically, we have them as the final comment in our course. They're asked to mention something, a text that made an impression on them, and then people who help them in the course. So they're asked to acknowledge their colleagues. So we're only really getting positive things. So it's not a real assessment. The, they are also doing the same student sur feedback survey that face-to-face -face students, and the completion rate is about at that same level. So mm -hmm. as far as, I think that you're going to have to develop a study and do that. I don't think yeah. that you, I don't think the instructor <laughs> in the course ought to ever be the one no, assessing no. Yeah. the satisfaction. It needs to be an external uh, party doing something that is very you know, blind and anonymous. Uh, I think we get a lot of dissatisfaction expressed to us face to face through email though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are a lot of people unhappy. I mean, I say that. You know, probably two people were unhappy and I took it so personally that I can't forget it. So, you know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi, Peggy. Okay. Um, I'm Peggy also. Um, I teach a couple online writing classes, which I know y'all do as well, and I have them do peer feedback and discussion boards. And I actually find, like, building on the etiquette, that they're always too nicey nice and it's very sugar coated. I liked it. <laughs> And I've tried to intervene and like give examples of language stems and prompts, and it's just not going very well. So do y'all have any ideas on how to really? And one of the students mentioned, well, if I really knew these people better, I feel I would feel better about providing some. They would probably do worse, job. <laughs> you know, what I am going to say that I think that that dynamic is true in face-to-face. -face. We have a lot of writing teachers here. And one of the ways that I have seen that dynamic change is that Dr. Jim Warren, in our department, has some very, very detailed peer response questions. And so it's all about answering the question. It's about looking at the writing and describing what one sees rather than talking about the writer. And I think that that has been the most successful. Because they get into their narratives and yeah. life stories, and it's way off track. Do you think he would share this? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> he absolutely would. And if he won't, I will. <laughs> <laughs>
they're not copyrighted at this point. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, one last question, Cedric. Uh, I was just wondering, that in, in online courses, have you had an opportunity? Any of you had an opportunity to teach um, soldiers who are deployed? And, and, and if, you, if you have, what's it like, and what sort of uh, challenges is uh, teaching to somebody who's deployed present? Do any of you, I, I mean, I have, have any of you? I haven't had deployed, I've had very recently back, yeah, but never, never. But, but this is a big. Yeah, we do. We, more technology on the first line, so we've literally had servicemen and women in downtown Baghdad on cell phones. And, and it, it's a very small window into a very large and rich online course or online program. So oftentimes we struggle with technology first and foremost, limited access to it or limited tools available to them. But then all the richness of place, right, to, to have them in that conversation, literally taking pictures or sharing thoughts, I mean, can really enrich a course. You know, I actually want to say that the best thing about the class for me is that people are known only through their ideas. And it is just the great equalizer. And I'm not going to filter what any student says by how they sit in a chair, how they look, what age they are, or anything else. I'm going to only know them by their ideas. I think that's remarkably democratic, you know, and, and lovely in so many ways. And what a great thought to end on. <laughs> right. So please join me in thanking Peggy and all of you.